uh, security features, okay, anonymity, uh, authentication, and confidentiality. Okay, now anonymity uh, means uh, people should not be able to tell that you've placed a call. Okay, that's really the sense. So it's kind of like an initialization process. You know, when you initiate a call, you don't want people to know that it's you who's made this call. Um, now, from the perspective of the users, that might be kind of important, right? Something you might sort of ordinarily sort of expect on a regular phone call. You have some level of anonymity. But from the point of view of the companies selling this product, they don't really care. <laughs> And come on, you know, if they want to make money, if you're anonymous or not, it doesn't matter. They just want to make sure you get the bill, right? The bill goes to the right place. So they need something here, uh, but, you know, they probably don't worry too much about that. And it's kind of similar for confidentiality. Okay, here we mean, you know, when you make a phone call, you probably have some expectation that nobody's listening in, you know, unless you did something illegal and the FBI doesn't like you, you know, so nobody's listening in. So you have that sort of expectation. When you're sending a, a, making a wireless call, right, it's going over this air interface, you don't have any such expectation unless it's encrypted, right? So we need to encrypt the data to get some confidentiality, at least over the air interface, okay? All right? And again, that's the kind of thing that, you know, customers would care about, but the company, they probably just want to do enough to reassure people. On the other hand, authentication is different, right? You have to be sure, for the company, they have to be sure that they know who made the call so they can get the bills to the right place. In particular, they really want to authenticate the caller. But do they need to authenticate the base station as well? Well, they didn't think so. <laughs> they said, oh, you know, why waste those extra message or two, you know? We won't waste our time on that authenticating the base station. So they only authenticate the uh, caller. And that's kind of a mistake, as we'll see here in a minute. Okay, so let's look at each of these really quickly. Uh, the anonymity, they use this, uh, uh, so the, the um, MC, okay, the ID is still sent at the start of the call, okay? The first thing you do is you send your ID. Uh, now you have to, authentication involves the key, so we do actually have an authentication protocol behind the scenes, but if you send your MC, I mean, that's really your ID, right? You're sending your ID. So what sort of anonymity could you possibly have if you send your ID at the start of a call? Well, okay, they do something, it's probably a little bit lame, but what they do is you do send the MC at the start, then they change it, okay? They change it to something else known as a TIMC. <laughs> I'm not making this up, okay? Temporary mobile subscriber ID. And when they make the change, they encrypt it, and then they change it again. They sort of constantly change the TIM scene. So um, it kind of provides sort of a really weak form of, of, of uh, uh, anonymity. If, you, if you're, somebody's out there listening to the calls, if they capture the very start of the call, they will know it's you, okay? But if they somehow miss that, they won't know it's you because these things are just randomly generated. You know, as a practical matter, that's probably okay in a lot of environments. It would be really hard to recover the uh, start of every call in a busy sort of uh, network. But it's not really anything uh, all that strong. Okay, how about the authentication? Okay, again, the caller is authenticated, but not the base station. Okay, so how does that work? How do we authenticate the caller? Okay, where is the key? The key is the thing that's going to authenticate you, right? So your key is in your mobile, and where else is that key? Home network. It's way back here in your home network. Okay, you're not talking to your home network. You're talking to the uh, base station. So somehow you have to go all the way back to your home network to complete the authentication. So, so how does that work? Well, okay, the base station gets your uh, MC, right, your ID, and figures out where is the appropriate home network, and it goes and contacts that. and says, hey, this guy is trying to place a call. The home network generates a random value, okay, a random challenge, right? And at the same time, it takes that random challenge and hashes it with the key KI, which it knows, okay? And then it sends those two values, the hash value and well, the hash value, which is known as XRES, expected response, okay? The XRES, and this is a hash function. So it takes a hash of the random the key KI and sends the XRES and the RAND to the uh, base station, OK? 
you know, what does the base station do with that? Do you suppose? Challenge response, right? Sends the challenge being the RAND to the mobile. And if the mobile is who it really claims to be, it knows the key KI, so it can compute the hash and send back the correct value, which is known as SRES. <laughs> and I forget what S stands for. So it's supposed to compute the same hash and send it back. And then the base station can check to see if those two things match. If it does, you're authenticated. You know the key, right? It's not a replay because we sent you this challenge. Um, OK, the beauty of this, it's a pretty simple system. It's just like encrypting a challenge. We're using a hash instead of encryption. But you know that you have to know the key to make it work, right? Um, the beauty, though, is this key KI. KI is in the mobile. It's in the home network, and it never leaves those locations. It would be really bad if you had to start passing that thing around, right? Because that would make it more susceptible to cloning. OK, what about the confidentiality? Well, they use a stream cipher, right? Uh, much like we saw in WEP. Why do you suppose they use a stream cipher in all these wireless things we're looking at? They just don't like block ciphers? Well, it could actually uh, partly be an issue of efficiency. You don't have much computing power. Uh, stream ciphers are a little faster, a little bit more efficient. Today, that wouldn't be an issue. But yet, people still use stream ciphers in these kind of uh, environments. Why is that? Errors get washed away over time. OK, errors. That's exactly right. OK, in um, uh, uh, this uh, GSM environments, estimated like one in a 1,000 bits is a typical uh, error rate. Now, what happens if you're using a block cipher? Suppose you're using a block cipher in CVC mode and one bit is in error. What happens? Two blocks. Two entire blocks are messed up. Now, if you're using a stream cipher and one bit is in error, how many bits are messed up? One bit. Okay. I like one bit much more than two blocks. Okay. Now, you can kind of work around that with error correcting codes and stuff, but it's a lot more work than it's worth. Just use a stream cipher. Okay, so here's... Oh, okay. Back to this. Okay, confidentiality. OK, so we need a key to encrypt, right? So we've got this challenge response thing going on to authenticate. When we're done, we want to have a key so we can encrypt the data. OK, this key is going to be calculated in a very similar way to the uh, X-ray stuff. Okay, the home network is going to take this RAND, the same random challenge, the same key, KI, and it's just going to hash it with a different hash function. Okay, the other one was A3, this is A8, okay. not the same. It's not a typo. Okay, different hash function, and it gets a value out and it calls that KC. Okay, that's the encryption key. Okay, when it sends the RAND and the XRES from the from the home network to the base station, it also sends KC. Okay, so uh, these three things get sent: <coughs> KC, RAND, and XRES. So if you ever read anything about uh, uh, GSM, they always talk about the triples. Okay, the triple is RAND, XRES, and KC. Okay, those are the three things that get sent from the home network to the base station. Okay, so now the base station does the authentication. Once the authentication is done, it's <coughs> going to encrypt using this. Okay, now how does the mobile know this value? It uses the RAND with the key and the K. It knows the hash function, it knows KI, it knows RAND, it computes it. Okay, so now they share a key that they can use to encrypt, uh, to confidential, protect the confidentiality. What cipher is used? A51, the one we talked about earlier. There's actually another version of that called A52, which is even worse. So. <laughs> Again, the beauty here is that the key KI never leaves the home network. Okay, so you get the, authenticate, the authentication and a session key without ever having to distribute out that key. Okay, let's look at the picture. Um, we can see this, of how this is uh, supposed to work. Okay, so you're the mobile. You show up in some visited network, right? You try to place a call. First thing you send is your MC, right? Here's, here's, this is me trying to make a call. The base station <coughs> has to go all the way back to the home network. Okay, it says this uh, person is trying to place a, a call. The home network looks it up, right? Looks up the key KI. What does the home network compute? A RAND and XRES and KC. It computes that triple and it sends it back to the base station. 
Okay, the base station then can do the authentication process. Okay, it sends the random challenge to the mobile. If the mobile really is who it claims to be, it knows the key KI, so it can compute the hash uh, that corresponds to XRES, called SRES, which I wish I could remember what S stands for. Anyway, SRES. Uh, and if those SRES and XRES match, the authentication succeeds, and you go ahead and encrypt with the K key K sub C. Okay, just one uh, question here. So when we do this uh, communication here, how's that sent? What did we say about that? Do you steal? Normal telephone. Normal telephone. That's a normal telephone call. If you're trying to make the GSM as secure as a normal phone call, what do you have to do to protect that part? Nothing. 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 <laughs> no protection there. Okay. Makes it easy, right? Okay, so really the air interface is where all the action takes place. Okay, everything else is essentially unprotected. Right? Okay, now put yourself in Trudy's shoes. Okay, you're Trudy. Well, you can still see these values, right? You, you can see all this stuff. It's that's what happens over the air interface. That's what's sent over the air. Okay, so you get to see the random challenge and you get to see the S res. Okay, the SRES is the hash of the random value together with KI. And your Trudy, what do you want to know? KI, okay. So is it possible, if you see a bunch of these guys, you see a bunch of different pairs, can you determine what KI is? It's a hash function, but it's sort of like a known plain text attack on a cipher. You can think of it as being similar to that. If you see enough plain text, enough RANs, can you figure out, and the, and the values, the hash values, can you figure out what the key was? Well, you could think about doing like a forward search, right? Just guess values for the key key. But it's 128 bits. You're never going to find it. Okay, so that's, that's not going to work. Um, so if this is going to work, you know, if this is going to be secure, it, it can't be any correlations here. It has to be a good hash function, okay? Unfortunately, or fortunately if you're Trudy, it's not a good hash function. <laughs> hash function's bad. As, as we saw with A51, it's pretty bad too. And those things were designed in violation of Kirchhoff's principle and put into millions of cell phones and then somebody figured out they were bad. 